So I th think we're up to uh, over 50 participants now. So uh, thank you everyone for joining us today at the BHO Legal uh, UniDraw webinar on asset-based space financing in, in the post-COVID-19 economy. We're very grateful to all those who've joined and uh, we welcome you here. Uh, my name is Hamza, I'm a legal consultant at the UNIDRA Secretariat, and my job today is to be your facilitator. Um, I'll now hand over the floor to my Deputy Secretary General, Professor Anna Veneziano, who will, who will deliver some brief opening remarks before moving on to our panel discussion. So Anna, the floor is yours. Thank you, Hamza, and good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all of you. It is a great pleasure and an honor to extend a warm welcome to all of you on behalf of UNIDRA to this, uh, I must say, very exciting webinar on asset-based space financing in the post-COVID-19 economy. Our president, Professor Maria Chiara Malaguti, will then deliver concluding remarks. So my first and foremost, uh, but also pleasant duty is to thank uh, uh, Hao and particularly Oliver Heinrich and uh, Eric Belander for co-organizing this webinar. Oliver will be, as you know, our chair today and I will probably introduce him in a minute. Also many thanks to the distinguished panelists who accepted our invitation and allow me to thank also my colleague Hamza Hamed, who was uh, the main co-organizator on, on our side. Thank you very much. Now, why UNIDRA's interest in this topic? As you may know, UNIDRA in its role as an intergovernmental organization formulating uniform law instruments and standards to modernize and harmonize commercial and private law has devoted particular attention to access to finance and has developed a number of instruments to facilitate this. And one of the flagship instruments is the Cape Town Convention on International Interest on Mobile Equipment with its protocols by now four providing an enabling international legal regime to facilitate asset-based financing on high-value equipment, aircraft, railway rolling stock, mining, construction and ag agricultural equipment, and space assets, and protect creditors' rights in a global environment. So the space protocol focuses in particular on the financing of space assets and offers an additional opportunity to parties to structure their financial agreements. More generally, I would like to say that UNIDRA has a keen interest in contributing within our field of expertise to the development of an efficient, but also transparent legal environment for the burgeoning space economy to foster a level playing field in line with the direction set by the specialized organizations, particularly UNOSA. So without uh, further ado, I'm very pleased to introduce our chair, uh, Oliver Heinrich. Dr. Heinrich is co-founder and partner uh, with uh, BHO Legal, a boutique law firm based in Cologne, Germany, with focus on aerospace and high technology projects. He has a long-standing work experience in, in the field of air and space law. I will not uh, mention all his uh, accolades and, uh, and all his achievements, but since 2010, he has been a permanent advisor to the European GNSS agency at the time in Brussels and Prague. Uh, he has made an international name for himself uh, through numerous publications and lectures on many aspects of air and space law, uh, particularly also on public procurement. And uh, I must say we are very um, fortunate to count him as advisor in our work on the uh, implementation of the space project uh, protocol. So Oliver, um, the floor is yours and thank you very much. Yes, uh, <clears throat> thank you. Uh, thank you also from, from my side, first of all, uh, Big thanks to um, to the whole team at UNIDRA, uh, Professor Malaguti, Professor Veneziano, uh, Hamza Hamid, who, who who set up this whole uh, um, webinar in an in an extremely short time period. Also thanks to my colleague Eric. Uh, I'm very very happy to be here today, and and we're looking very much forward uh, to uh, to the panel discussion. Uh, on this rather important topic uh, in um, a very 
disturbing time as we're currently having. And uh, without further ado, uh, I would indeed like to start uh, a short introductory um, presentation on our, our survey, which uh, we uh, conducted uh, together with our esteemed colleagues at uh, UNIDRA. Um, and from there on, we will take it into the, uh, into the panel discussion, uh, starting with Mr. Miyagi, um, uh, who I will ask about his opinion on, on the topic. Then uh, Mrs. Dasta will um, follow on uh, with, I believe, a short presentation on uh, European Investment Bank activities also and, and their activities in space financing. And then we will have Mr. Mikoska uh, also uh, looking into this from the space financing perspective with his long-standing experience in the field. Um, having said that, um, the whole survey idea was basically initiated um, in spring, summer 2020. So it's already quite a bit, uh, quite a while ago. Um, and we were obviously all very much disturbed about the COVID-19 crisis. We were very much disturbed and concerned in particular what impact this crisis might in fact have on the financing uh, activities overall and the investment activities overall, but obviously particularly in the area of space financing. Um, we were already able to look back on quite a number of surveys which had been conducted at the time by uh, renowned institutions and uh, industry participants and consultant firms. Uh, in particular, we were looking into the uh, April 2020 assessment conducted by PwC, which uh, stated or predicted that access to finance would in fact suffer very heavily um, due to COVID-19 risks, which would lead to a risk aversion of investors to continue their financing activities. And further, since there was this risk aversion, it was also considered there might be a tendency of trying to reduce the existing risks, uh, keeping to the current portfolio, but not entering into new investments. Furthermore, we looked upon a study that was uh, conducted by Slush, which was more of a general nature, um, which conducted, uh, which, which uh, revealed that around 60% of venture capital investors predicted that COVID-19 would have a heavy negative impact on the overall investment activities. And 75% of angel investors uh, were looking also at a negative output. Um, furthermore, there were other studies um, which were conducted by the, um, by uh, the SP Institute, uh, which uh, brought forward, again, a heavy impact on the financing economic system, in particular, that there will be no longer the ability of the, of, of the space industry, especially for small startups and R&D enterprises, to finance themselves on the market. So that was really concerning uh, in that sense. And over more, uh, furthermore, um, there was a study, particularly in UK, uh, on the impact and recovery, which uh, was also revealing that there might be a heavy impact, especially on, on new companies, and they would abandon their plans of continuing the financing activities. In August already, uh, 2020, there was an OECD paper to wrap this very quickly up. Um, which was saying that startups are in particularly vulnerable to the current crisis and private investors would put their decisions on hold. So again, um, there was a prediction of quite heavy impacts. So we thought on this basis, it would be worthwhile to do a further survey, which was more focused on the space financing, in particular, the question of what benefit the space protocol that Unidwa was working on together with its members for quite many years would have on, on the financing activities and whether in fact this could improve the situation as it presented itself. So the aim of our, 
presentation of, of, of our survey was really to, fur uh, to further investigate what the market reports really, uh, how the market reports would really materialize in the space sector. Then what securities were required in order to secure further the availability of financing. And in particular, how asset-based financing was currently used and how it could in the future improve the situation as it presented itself. Overall, we had 22 questions which were raised. Some of them were building on each other and we received quite a number of, of, um, of feedbacks from experts of the financing community who were giving us uh, an overview with regard to the following um, findings of the survey, which obviously no surprise, there was the concern that the COVID-19 crisis would have a significant impact on the situation. Um, however, mostly on the short-term liquidity. So that was um, the, uh, the, the feedback which we received. Um, further, which was kind of consoling, uh, finances overwhelmingly uh, in, uh, stated their intent to stay in the industry and to even further support new startups. And they then said that with regard to the predicted impact, COVID-19 would very likely impact on seed and startup funding the most. Furthermore, we, uh, our, our survey brought forward that uh, the majority of financing financiers was in fact concerned about cross-border enforceability of security assets. Um, even though they were not using the space protocol or going into the into the into the concept of of, um, of asset based financing themselves yet they were willing to explore the possibilities and mechanism of asset based financing further on and in particular with regard to cross border enforceability this is of course something which we think the space protocol will bring a real or could bring a real benefit to the industry Furthermore, according to the survey, there was a majority of, uh, of the, can, of the uh, respondents which believed that uh, the asset-based financing could bring the possibility of reducing the risk within the space industry. And in particular, that possibility of financing would be beneficial to bridge financing. Now we are obviously moving forward in time and um, while everything was really blurry and kind of frightening for everyone who looked upon it uh, in, the, in the initial months uh, of the COVID crisis, we can now say that fortunately um, the overall outcome was not as, as, as horrible as we feared uh, initially, at least for the space industry and for the financing industry. Um, looking at the numbers, uh, which is particularly uh, relevant, uh, despite the expectations that infrastructure would be hardest hit by the crisis, the year 2020 turned out to be of record investments of $8.9 billion, which were invested in that crisis year. Um, and furthermore, even on the overall scale, the year resulted in about 25.6 billion euros of investments in the space sector, which was in fact the third largest year on record for investments. So overall, the outcome was not as bleak as it apparently initially seemed. However, when we look into these, into these figures, it very easily um, turns out that there is a clear focus on region and a clear focus on the area and the activities which were being financed. And this is on the US and China geographically. And the activities are really on very, very few companies and very few activities as we already know them. So overall, while the outcome was not as bad as it could have been, as it was forecast, there is still as we believe room for improvement, which also the concept and the instrument of asset-based financing could bring into the industry. 
Now, this is already my, my uh, brief overview of the survey which we, uh, which we conducted. And I will now turn uh, to our esteemed panelists. And I would like to start uh, with a colleague, uh, Mr. Miyagi from uh, Tokyo. Uh, he will also give a short introduction of his law firm uh, there. Um, uh, he's an attorney at law uh, qualified in Japan and New York uh, with particular expertise in asset and structured finance. He worked on broad range on financial transactions and legal matters. His expertise includes cross-border infrastructure financing as aspects of operation and financing leases, sale and lease back in particular of aircraft, which would like to know if he also used the aircraft protocol and tax driven structured financing. Uh, before giving the floor to you, Mr. Miyagi, I would just briefly continue in the introduction of our speakers. Uh, we then have Mrs. Uh, Duster from the European Investment Bank. Uh, she's head of division of innovation finance uh, advisory at the European Investment Bank. Uh, she has 25 years of experience in the financial industry working uh, for large and private uh, institutions in New York, London, and Luxembourg. So really the centers of financing when you look at the space industry, particularly. Um, she is a, um, a bachelor in economics uh, from Columbia University and an executive MBA from London Business School. And she's also co-founded the European High Yield Association, which is now part of of the Association of Financial Markets in Europe. And she was nominated top 50 women uh, in credit by Credit Magazine in 2006. So congratulations to that, even though it's already 2006, but still great achievement. Um, furthermore, uh, finally, uh, of the round, last but not least, uh, Mr. Makoska from Australia, uh, Deputy Chief, Chief, Chief Executive of the Australian Financial Security Authority. Um, adjunct Industry Fellow at the University of Griffiths, Queensland, Australia. Uh, he furthermore oversaw the establishment of Australia's personal property securities regime, which is now uh, seen as global leading practice and is conservatively estimated at supporting an excess of 25% of, uh, of, of the GDP. Uh, Furthermore, he represented Australia in negotiations to finalize the MAC protocol, which is also uh, under, uh, within the auspices of, um, of UNIDRA, under the Cape Town Convention and has presented on the financing in the first round of Space Economy webinar uh, services hosted by UNOSA. So uh, without further ado, um, I would now like to hand, over, hand the floor over to Mr. Miyagi and uh, you have uh, the control, I think. <laughs> Hi, Olga. Thank you very much for the introduction. And, you know, it's my pleasure to, you know, having this kind of uh, great opportunity to, you know, make myself, you know, introduced uh, in this, you know, opportunity. And, you know, let me, you know, introduce my, our firm first. You know, we are Nishimura Nasahi, an international law firm having 18 branches around the world, originally from Japan. And uh, we have one of the biggest asset financing practices in Tokyo. And uh, I'm an asset financing partner. And, you know, I would like to, you know, uh, introduce the, you know, outcome of the, uh, you know, survey uh, we made in Japan. Uh, we have collected 15, you know, answers in total uh, with Professor Kozuka from uh, Gakushin University, uh, consisting of three major banks and 12 recent companies. Many, many are familiar with the raising of the Cape Town Convention through their experiences on asset financing, uh, especially aircraft financing. Um, uh, I would like uh, to make a point that the, you know, uh, the timing uh, that we conducted uh, the survey was in uh, October and November 2020. Uh, in that you know, period, you know, that the entire picture of the impact of the you know, COVID-19 has yet to be foreseen. So, 
the result is something you know not very very clear and uh, the uh, uh, financial institutions we corrected the answers from are you know kind of uh, having experiences in the equity investments area and project financing areas uh, as well uh, but uh, in the you know space financing industry but have very limited asset financing you know transactions so the Actually, you know, outcome is not uh, very, very related to the asset financing, uh, but uh, still very interesting to see. And, you know, to see the details, you know, sections, uh, you know, one and two uh, are, you know, about the impact of the, you know, COVID-19 crisis. And uh, partly due to the, you know, timing uh, that we made the survey, it was not very clear uh, from the survey how far uh, COVID-19 you know, affects adversely the space financing. But uh, you know, it is clear that you know, many pointed out that the uh, crisis will have certain impact, but uh, we can see that a crisis would not stop totally the financiers attempt to provide space financing. Section three are uh, about the securities taken for space financing. Many answer that the securities over assets would ensure the ability of financing. Section four uh, is about the uh, asset financing for space industry. And asset financing are yet to be very common in Tokyo or in Japan, but the uh, you know, it is clear that uh, the major concerns of uh, financiers are enforceability, reposition, and recovery in relation to the you know securities over the space assets. And uh, we can also see that uh, internationally recognized securities uh, registration system, therefore, and enforceability of such securities would surely enhance the availability of space financing uh, from the you know, result of the survey. Uh, to very briefly summarize the outcome, uh, COVID-19 has had certain negative impact on the space financing. Having said that, uh, financiers are very, uh, still keen to have the opportunities for providing space financing. And uh, recognition of securities and enforceability there would increase the availability of space financing. Uh, that is something uh, we need to establish. And you know, that's the end of my you know, initial presentation and I'm happy to you know, uh, continue after the, you know, uh, the other, you know, participants, you know, presentations. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Miyagi, um, for this initial introduction and and your your explanations on on the survey and uh, further on, on the crisis impact. Uh, obviously, what I did not mention initially was that after the presentations of the panelists uh, and their introductory remarks, we will have a roundtable discussion. We'll have the possibility from the audience to ask questions, directly address them to the panelists. Okay. Um, I will now uh, move forward to uh, Ms. Dasta, and uh, I believe she also has a presentation to share. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. And also thank you to UNIDRA for this excellent event and also to you, Oliver, for the, uh, for the survey, which I think is really interesting and uh, happy to, to share a bit our views. Um, I will perhaps start with giving you a quick introduction of the EIB and then giving you also a bit of background of how we are coming into this particular uh, subject area through our advisory work and a study that we published um, now um, yeah, two years ago, but I think which still has quite a lot of relevance. Now, uh, if you could maybe 
bring it to the next slide. Absolutely great. Uh, you see the QR code. This is a study that actually is on our website. So please feel free to upload it. And at the time, um, we basically um, did this study at the request of the European Commission to better understand how the new space or how the space sector is generally sort of um, developing. Now, why is space important? I mean, I think from an EU perspective, it is a very strategic sector um, and increasingly so. There is actually uh, now a new director uh, directorate um, in the European Commission that is um, for space and defense under Commissioner Thierry Breton. Um, so so you will see increasingly new initiatives and a lot more focus on the space sector, but also space very much linked uh, to digital and, and just the technological, uh, technological sovereignty and autonomy that Europe would like to increasingly support. Therefore, space also uh, playing an important role and really being also an, a center for uh, innovation or a lot of innovation really coming through the space sector. And in particular, if you now look at some of our big uh, challenges with respect to climate and other issues, there is increasingly, I think, across the world, a view that the space sector and the technologies that are being developed, uh, whether it is on the observation, Earth observation or uh, or other things could be actually really critical for um, helping us tackle those challenges. So therefore, when the European Commission approached the bank advisory uh, to look at this, this was actually a very um, topical and pivotal uh, time to look at this. And you will see briefly just sort of um, that obviously we looked at from both the demand and the financing, um, supplier financing. And on this slide, just very briefly summarize, I won't go into much detail, but ultimately what we saw is when we look at the new space, you have very similar characteristics of the deep tech companies challenges, um, you know, needing a lot of capital early on, high technological risk, often uh, also high perceived market risk. Who is the customer who will pay for this, um, you know, product? And then you have on the supply side, um, very much an, perhaps an insufficient understanding of the, the value of these technologies, the, what they actually uh, can um, bring to the market. Uh, you have perhaps a very niche investor group, so it's not a mainstreamed, um, not yet mainstreamed. Um, there is, of course, a notion of what space, traditional space sector has been, but not as much in the, in the sort of what the new space could bring. If you maybe move to the next slide, please. So therefore, our um, study actually put some important recommendations forth to the European Commission and the EIB itself or the EIB group, in particular, uh, emphasizing the need to support the wider um, ecosystem. I mean, I think this is really critical. And I think our, in our discussion today, we may be touching on it. Uh, you know, you really need to look at it from a regulatory legal uh, perspective, but you also need to bring in various players, but it's policy, um, traditional uh, policymakers, traditional players, new companies, the startup community, and then also the investor, obviously, community bring in um, not just the equity investors, but a broader group of investors to this. Now, on the financing side, there was a lot of emphasis placed on, in fact, the innovative um, nature of financing that needs to be brought in and hence also I think the focus of this particular seminar being quite interesting you know looking at uh, various models whether it's asset based or cash flow based whether it is a push or pull mechanisms and here I would perhaps just highlight the importance of procurement a public procurement and I think in the COVID crisis this perhaps is something that we should really play pay even greater attention to. Um, now, when it therefore comes to the um, sort of the various uh, ways to improve the access to finance, we're looking at, um, you know, what can the public sector do? What can play, uh, banks like the European Investment Bank do uh, in, in order to um, improve the access to finance? in particular also through some of the um, advisory activities such as financial advice, helping companies to have a better understanding where the money may come from and also develop perhaps new financial mechanisms. And this brings me to the last slide, um, which was one of the recommendations of our study was indeed to create a space finance lab where 
we bring in basically the relevant um, you know, actors in the, in the space community as part of this ecosystem development and look at it from a financial engineering perspective. So hence topics like asset versus project-based financing, or you know, how can we get more interest by the lend bank you know, uh, lending community in the sector are all very important topics. We have had so far um, basically two in-person sessions in the good old pre-COVID days. There was a virtual session last year that we uh, organized together with ESA. And there is going to be a next session that we will organize together with the European Commission virtually um, in, um, in the second quarter. So perhaps let me just maybe then use a few minutes just to comment on, on the actual survey. We have perhaps not seen in any tangible way um, that companies have suffered, I mean, companies in the space sector have really suffered from COVID. But I, I, that doesn't necessarily mean that it, they haven't. It's just that, you know, what we have actually seen is quite an uptick in demand. And on the EIB side, just the last uh, six months, we've actually financed two very innovative space companies called Spire and deorbit with our venture debt product. Um, so it's a quasi equity product, which was very suitable to these type of uh, companies in a high growth uh, sort of deep tech space. What we also have seen is generally, um, I guess space linked to both, as I mentioned, sustainability issues, climate, but also as an enabler of digital. And given the huge digital acceleration, uh, we have seen the space sector in some ways also benefit to some extent in terms of visibility and um, yeah, and, and being considered perhaps as part of the solution of many of the new enabling technologies. Now, um, when it comes to the asset-based approach, um, certainly the companies that we are right now primarily looking at are in the satellite space. And there we are not necessarily seeing that the asset-based approach would actually make all that much sense. Um, you know, in the satellites, certainly we are very often looking also at those that are creating um, smaller satellites. There, the, the point is that ultimately what makes them bankable is that you have some visibility on cash flow generation and back on the back of that, you actually get comfortable that you know, your, your loan would be repaid. The residual value of such satellites, which actually have the tendencies being that they are of shorter value, they are smaller, uh, shorter life, Therefore, you know, the case is perhaps harder to make. And I would maybe distinguish, and this is maybe a discussion topic, are we talking when we talk of space, you know, are we talking also of aircrafts? Because certainly in the aircraft industry, this is a very uh, common approach to use assets, uh, asset-based financing. And indeed, there may therefore be uh, a lot of relevance there. And if you then look later at maybe space tourism and some of the more asset intensive areas, perhaps those models could become very relevant. So what I would generally leave maybe as my last point is the notion of financial innovation is very important. Hence, I think topics like the one that you're raising uh, are really crucial. Um, and the legal uh, side and sort of the Cape Town Convention, all of those things, are of course, very increasingly even more important as the sector matures. And we perhaps see actually new uh, business opportunities to also apply asset-based financing. So indeed a topic which we would like to pick up also in the space finance lab to the extent that we have experts in this panel or also in the audience who would like to contribute. So thank you very much to have me here. Yeah, great. Uh, Shiva, thank you very much for this uh, highly interesting presentation. You're already uh, touching on topics which I believe will foster the uh, later discussion round, I hope. In particular, the overall concept of, ex of, of expanding space uh, into an economic era. Uh, where suddenly we are looking at, at, at an enabler of new, uh, of new economic possibilities, which is more and more increasing under the, under the name of new space, obviously. And this is really something which I believe we, we will uh, probably have a further discussion on. Um, okay, uh, now, last but not least, as I already said, uh, Gavin, it's your, it's your presentation time and your initial remarks. Thank you. Great, thank you, Oliver. 
uh, you know, thank you to Uni Dua, thank you to Professors Malaguti and Venenziano, um, you know, for the uh, for hosting today. Um, it's a pleasure and a privilege to actually be such uh, here amongst such distinguished speakers um, and also others uh, involved in the panel. Thank you to Hamza for for pulling it all together, uh, as previously mentioned, also um, by Professor Venenziano. It's it's a it's a real I think nascent uh, topic. It's such an important topic for the future, as uh, as has been mentioned by the previous speakers. And I guess at its core, any industry, including the space industry, does not exist unless there is financing. Um, and I think that you know is a really important aspect. It's really in the new space area, uh, an emerging industry still. And I think that that is something which, um, as uh, Shiva just mentioned, in fact, financial innovation is such a key uh, component to facilitating you know, what the industry may be able to, to do in the future. Um, so I congratulate you, uh, and obviously Oliver with your BHO legal team for um, co-conducting the, the, the sur this survey. Um, I think there is um, some room for this in the industry. Though I guess uh, also picking up on what Shiva has mentioned, I don't think it's a panacea. I think it forms a key cog uh, as to what the industry may be able to, to you know, need into the future and, and the like, and, and it's something which um, asset-based financing is a really important component to be able to actually support risk uh, for financiers when you are talking in particular, probably, uh, you know, probably more pre-VC, uh, you know, there is a relationship with project finance, which I'll touch on in some of my comments um, as well, which obviously has a, an important part to play in any industry development as well. I find that we are in an interesting time where um, when you look at the juxtaposition of what we have um, in the broad economy, um, you know, access to finance is a really significant challenge for startups, for SMEs, for early stage businesses. One of the key points which I'll mention is um, that you know, businesses before they become attractive for venture capital finance have a full life cycle um, before even getting to that particular point. Uh, I think you know we all know some of the stories around you know Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak starting in their garage. Um, they certainly weren't um, you know an immediate success overnight. It takes time and effort to do this. In fact, um, you know there's also Google, HP, Microsoft, and uh, and Amazon are also stated to have started in garages. And I think that's one of the key points to be able to think about what the financing needs are, are here as well. The survey touches on um, the fact that, uh, or yeah, it, it, the, the survey actually did survey finances of the industry. Though I do wonder when I was reading this, whether it was picking up on in the minds of those financiers, those businesses who are aspiring to enter the industry as well, or is it thinking, or are they thinking in their minds about the financing of those already in the industry or those at the later stage of um, uh, the later stage deals. And I think you mentioned Oliver actually in your remarks as a follow up from the survey, in fact, some analysis that you did, perhaps of the, the financing of the industry in, in 2020 did indicate that late stage deal financing was probably the predominant area of growth um, as well. So I think when we look at that, we look at the juxtaposition in the, in the, uh, the economic uncertainty that we have, but we have very low cost of funds today um, high liquidity generally. Um, it's a really interesting um, situation to be in. One of the benefits, which doesn't really surprise me that the, uh, the, 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 those already in the space industry weren't necessarily as impacted. I think for the reasons Shiva mentioned are very good ones in terms of the enabling capabilities for digital, et cetera, being a really key component of that. However, you know, the space industry with its long tail pre-revenue does generally, from my understanding, have patient capital um, within it. And that's something where, something where you know, the investors aren't looking for a return overnight. They are anticipating something um, you know, over time to be able to, to, to come from um, those investments. But <clears throat> one of the, uh, the key things I think that um, I'd also touch on is that you know, with the financing here, um, and where asset-based financing and other forms of financing may be able to support particularly the earlier stage, you might even call it pre-seed financing potentially, it depends upon your exact definition um, that you wish to apply in this space, is that asset-based financing along with other supply chain financing type of uh, 
uh, mechanisms, um, uh, and I'll speak there in a moment in more detail about that, really support, uh, and in my experience in talking to um, space uh, industry entrepreneurs, you know, it reduces the dilution, um, obviously, for, you know, those particular entrepreneurs before they are then able to actually, you know, get to the point that they are willing to more, more, more willing and ready to give up equity. And that's a really important thing to think about in here as well as to what role it plays in that very early stage, you know, through to the point that they um, you know, get to uh, wanting to give up equity and, you know, take up venture capital in, in what is more traditional forms. So venture debt, I suppose, is the, uh, um, you know, the way that it's described. And that's really, really where I think the asset based financing component, you know, plays a, you know, a, a very particularly significant role. However, again, even there, it's not a panacea. Um, because of the nature of the industry as well, you know, are, do, do the businesses have assets, um, you know, at that point in time is, is something that is a, also a useful consideration. The, and this is where I think there is actually a correlation and complementarity, you know, with things like the United Nations Convention on the Assignments of Receivables um, in International Trade. Now, I think, you know, looking at the asset-based financing where you, it does include intangibles when you are talking about a piece of software, for example, under the space protocol, as well as obviously the hard asset or the physical asset of the actual satellite, for example, as using the example that Shiva uh, mentioned and, and looking at your European Investment Bank work there. But then there's also how you monetize potential uh, future financing flows the, um, from the use of an asset where you may lease a, an asset or something like that, where you actually have, you know, you can rely on your future um, revenue streams to be able to support access to finance as well at an earlier stage. And things like the United Nations Convention on uh, the Assignment of Receivables is also something that can really support intangibles for the accounts receivable type financing as well, if you like. So this, I think, in terms of the space protocol, asset-based financing generally, you know, um, you know, can play a really important role as a complementary tool in the uh, in in the, um, the, the the system overall. Um, I do think it's interesting when you when you look through the survey, it does uh, sort of indicate that there could be, with I think it's question four point three, a potential gap in the industry, um, you know, in terms of the financing instruments which are available. And I think that that is something that could be very useful, um, you know, for the industry to, to consider going to that financial innovation point um, that Shiva mentioned as to how, what, what really are the needs of the industry and how can they be un un unlocked. Complementing this particular work with a survey, uh, you know, further survey, I think, of, you know, the participants um, within the industry. And again, I do you know, emphasize, I mean, not only those already in the industry, but aspiring to be in the industry, I think is uh, how you do that is a, quite a challenge, I suspect, to be honest. Um, but I think that that is something which would be extremely interesting to, to, to look at as a part of um, the approach that uh, is taken here. Um, so I think in terms of the, you know, the, the, the venture debt approaches, I suppose, what the key, uh, the key relationship is that I wanted to just highlight as a part of my opening comments here. Um, and really just to, to, to touch on, I think that, you know, with the, uh, the, the financing world in, the, in, 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 you know, looking for yield, which a lot of investors are doing at the moment, how that might be able to be translated into um, a venture debt type of a regime is something that I've been thinking about and, and looking at for a little while now. Um, there is a lot of work going on, obviously, in the development finance world. I do a, uh, a bunch of stuff with the World Bank, um, you know, and looking at the way that development finance supports industry development, private sector development. There's actually a, a, a bit of a correlation with industry development in the space sector, even where you look at how risk can be shared um, to be able to support access to finance, you know, through those earlier stages as well. And that's something that we are uh, happy to touch on further as we as we go through the course of the discussion today. But I'll leave it there and hand back to you, Oliver. Thank you. Oh, wonderful. Thank you, uh, Gavin. I honestly I couldn't be more happy with the with the sequence of your presentations, perfectly building up on each other, and and Gavin then really closing the loop and giving us the full picture. Uh, very nice. Thank you, all of you. Uh, very happy about that. And well, um, as it is, um, we're going to have the the discussion rounds. Um, 
I would like to first start with uh, questions which we have received from the audience because experience shows that at the end time might be too short to uh, really touch on all the audience uh, comments. So uh, I would like to start with that first and, and I would like to read uh, to you uh, what has been uh, posed to us as the first question is um, on the space protocol um, itself. Um, in your view, is the protocol on uh, space assets able to accommodate the interests of prospect uh, prospective debtors and creditors with the existing formula? And if not, which one needs to be changed? Uh, maybe I would pose that question uh, to Kentaro um, first, uh, if possible, if you, or that okay for you? To answer the question, yeah. or anyone else <laughs> raise the point? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, actually, you know, as um, you know, uh, practitioner uh, in this, you know, asset financing, you know, industry, you know, uh, what is quite important uh, is to, you know, uh, you know, the, uh, you know, do the, you know, asset financing, you know, the, you know, recovery and uh, in the establishment of the you know, securities or recognition of the securities around the world. And, you know, it was, you know, quite important for, you know, aircraft financing and, uh, you know, in terms of, the, you know, space financing, uh, things would be the same. And, you know, the, you know, securities without, uh, you know, enforceability is you not know, something that, uh, you know, banks can rely on. And you know the current raising has been you know uh, examined through the you know uh, asset financing uh, you know practices you know especially on the you know, aircraft and they have worked you know so far and especially you know we can you know for the banks are uh, you know that could be you know examine their you know recognition of the you know securities. Uh, by you know looking to the you know, raising you know uh, provided under the you know Cape Town Convention, and uh, we could uh, you know try to uh, you know see the same you know in the aircraft uh, you know space financing as well. So the actually you know I thought that uh, you know what was you know currently you know being done in the aircraft financing could be also you know, down in the, you know, space, you know, financing as well, especially, you know, the, you know, registration, you know, process or registration systems are something very important, you know, accessible from around the world, you know, easy to see what rights are, you know, on certain assets and, you know, what would, you know, what has enhanced you know, secondary markets and, you know, financing in aircraft, you know, tradings. And, you know, we could see the same, but uh, actually, you know, at the same time uh, from the uh, practice, uh, we could point out that, uh, you know, secondary market for, you know, satellites and the space asset has yet to be, you know, uh, mature. So there actually, you know, uh currently we cannot see how uh the you know enforced securities can be you know kind of you know uh made into value or materialized so there actually you know we would also need to you know see how the uh you know secondary market uh, would be you know uh, established uh, but uh, you know uh, to summarize you know i would say that uh, you know i I would, uh, you know, the you know current regime and the you know Cape Town Convention would work for the space financing as well. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, encouraging, I would say. <laughs> um, anyone else from the panel who would like to uh, to comment on the question raised? Uh, yeah, Oliver, thank you. I might just jump in. I think that there, um, you know, what uh, Kintaro mentioned is is exactly right. I think that you know what financiers, um, you know, really are looking for is how they can obviously mitigate their risks as a key part of their decision making um, process. The enforceability of um, their security interests are particularly uh, important, and I think that 
mechanisms like the space protocol certainly provide for that. I think you know we you know touched on that it's not a panacea for all types of financing, but certainly the ability to do that where there is asset-based financing is a really key part of it. The other key part is obviously to be able to ensure that you can um, both you know, protect your rights against third parties. And by having the register in place, um, which actually provides clear transparency about the priority rights um, and the ranking of, the, of those priority of those rights that you that you hold is a really key part to be able to ensure that that supports and and, and, and comes into the enforceability uh, part of the, the equation when that might be necessary to draw upon because it's very readily and easily identified who has the uh, the, the priority rights um, at that point in time through the registry process as well. But I'll just leave it there. Thank you. Sheila, any additional comments from your side? Okay. No, I think that's... But I think they already uh, answered quite perfectly. So yeah. <laughs> um, we might as well move on to the next question, which is actually two questions. I will I will go for the, for the second post the question first, because I think it, it best links to, uh, to our previous topic. Uh, noting the importance of having recourse rights to access revenue streams or repossessing and operating assets to satisfy a claim after default, what signals could states send to the financing community that would give necessary reassurances? Maybe that's something where Shiva can first try to comment on, should I? Um, I have to say, given that we are, we have not yet looked at sort of, we haven't gotten that far. I mean, maybe I should have perhaps also said that EIB has indeed financed, um, has been active in financing the space sector, but it has really done so either um, on a an, um, balance sheet. I mean, so either it's been effectively a sovereign risk to a public sector entity or to a rather large corporate entity. Um, and then, when in the more recent years, we have done risk sharing points. A very interesting actually transaction has been with uh, the Ariane launchers um, on a risk sharing basis based on uh, the uh, certain milestones. So we're taking really sort of, uh, we're, you know, on, on, on 100 million transactions, we're taking a rather sort of, uh, share, you know, risk sharing approach. And then the last one is this venture debt approach, which perhaps like, I mean, so Gavin put it as indeed asset base. I mean, we have so far, you know, for us, it's much more of a um, quasi equity. Uh, you know, it's for companies that have so far raised equity and to the point of not wanting to always dilute this precious equity, you then take on a debt that has nevertheless some perhaps warrants attached to it and, and, and is therefore, you know, somewhere between debt and equity, but paving the way for future debt. Now, so to your question on um, what signals states, if I understand correctly, I mean, the public sector, the, I think generally there is a huge signaling effect to the, ex, to the extent that the, the states provide regulatory certainty to the extent or at least some coherence and consistency, um, you know, and, and, and I guess this is where perhaps one issue that keeps coming up very often is, and which we had in our first uh, space finance lab is indeed, there is the UN and the UN protocols, and then you have the national legal regimes. And what is not yet clear, so therefore also to this question, um, you know, how do these things go and how from a then banker's perspective, where do you get your assurances? You know, is it from your, from the, the jurisdiction that the loan is given to, or is there something supranational that actually overrides it and would give you additional, you know, sort of uh, assurances? So, um, at this stage, I mean, I can, my answer would be perhaps that there is definitely a very strong signaling effect, but I'm not necessarily sure that this would really give the necessary comfort, but I would leave it maybe to Gavin and others who have perhaps more experience to give, um, and also Kentaro, of course, to give maybe more yeah. nuanced answers. No, thanks, Shiva. Look, I, I think um, if I may jump in, Oliver, thanks, Shiva, for, um, for passing the baton there. I think the signaling effect really is exactly as, as Shiva mentioned, though, it's really around that regulatory certainty um, that needs to be provided. One of the key points to be looking at, in fact, in um, 
the way that modern security interest laws work um, is to you know, is, is to really consider the role of the state. Um, now, the state must recognise in these types of uh, regimes that, in fact, they are not a party to the transaction. Um, so what do they need to do? They need to really provide the legal certainty, the regulatory certainty, and then the financial infrastructure to support that certainty um, in, the, in, in, the, um, in the area of particularly um, security interest um, you know, based financing arrangements, if you like there. When you look at finance, it's generally um, an agreement between two private parties. And I think the European Investment Bank would not see that it's actually influenced by political uh, influences when it's making its investment decisions. No doubt they're signed off by the board, but it's really more about um, obviously independence in the way that that assessment's done even. So looking at even institutions like that, private financiers are clearly making their own um, assessments doing their own due diligence to decide that. They want that legal and regulatory certainty. Um, you know, they want to be able to ensure that they can actually enforce where it does relate to cross-border, that they can have certainty about that as well. The jurisdiction upon which um, the, is determined where the law, what, what law of what jurisdiction will apply when it comes to enforcement is going to generally be covered obviously through the contractual arrangements, but is prescribed in the way that that needs to be defined um, in the relevant legal instruments such as, uh, and regulatory instruments such as the space protocol to make sure that that is clarified, you know, as a part of that process there as well. Those I think are the really you know, the, the key things and then providing the financial infrastructure such as the registries where they are relevant um, and clearly the space protocol has a, a registry that would be enacted uh, or, you know, uh, stood up as a part of the process once it gets to that particular point in time. But that's, uh, you yeah, know, I think that my response to that, thank you. Uh, thank you very much on touching on that private process uh, element. I think that's a perfect introductory point maybe for Kantaro to, uh, to, uh, to touch on because uh, coming from private practice law firm, uh, he's probably very close to that, to that concept uh, with the regulation really being the basis for the activities, but at the end we're looking at private parties. Maybe Kantaro you can yeah, actually, you know, uh, we totally, you know, concur with, you know, Gavin and Silver, you know, on that point. And uh, actually, you know, regulatory raising is quite, you know, essential uh, and very important to analyze the, the risks of the, you know, financing and the, you know, security as well. And, you know, when structuring, uh, you know, transaction uh, is uh, pretty, you know, important to see you know, what scheme can be, you know, achieved and uh, utilized uh, for financing. Let's say, you know, if we like to, you know, use an SPV uh, for financing, you know, what types of SPV can be used? And, you know, for the space financings, you know, uh, we cannot uh, foresee many things, you know, in financing or structuring the transaction. And, you know, as to the you know recourse to the you know earnings or incomes or from the you know operation of space assets, you know we also need to see how ensure uh, the you know recourse, you know uh, that would be you know something that uh, we definitely see the you know clarity of the you know regulatory raising uh, we are facing, um, you know the uh, structuring you know perspective. Uh, banks and financiers would look to the, you know, what can be used and what are allowed, uh, what licenses are necessary for doing, you know, providing, you know, space financing. Uh, and, you know, uh, I would say that, uh, you know, I would totally, you know, concur with, you know, giving and receiver on this point. Wonderful. Um, as, it, as it turns out, we have a follow-up question on what we just debated. And I would like to turn to that question. And then we have one other, which I believe we still should have time to answer. Um, so the follow-up uh, on, on, on the one is, um, is there a way to maximize regulatory certainty, maybe by a supernatural, uh, a super national agreement, um, then in, in the clear Im implementation only in the national law? And, and could there be a holistic approach to treaty ratification and national space legislation that would ultimately promote space economies? So 
So the question is really an overall regime on, an, on a supranational level, probably going beyond what we currently have with the space protocol. I mean, I can uh, give it a try, but I, as I said, I mean, I'm not a lawyer and I would like to have uh, people coming in who have perhaps more uh, of an of a in-depth understanding. But I guess as a Luxembourger, I should perhaps in this panel uh, refer to uh, the fact that Luxembourg um, has is, I think, the second country in the world that has a, a law on uh, resources, on space resources. And I think maybe Hamza or others who are really sort of following these things uh, can uh, maybe comment. But my understanding is this is precisely sort of perhaps what this question is alluding to. You have this UN... Um, sort of overall frameworks. And then you have, my understanding is the US and Luxembourg, but it could be that there are now in the meanwhile other countries that have then created national laws, so space laws. Um, this particular space law, as far as my understanding was, but again, I would uh, be happily corrected, uh, in particular claim to even improve on the US one in the sense that, or give a competitive advantage in, in, the, in the sense that, uh, it gave some uh, additional certainty as to the ownership of whatever you find in space in terms of mineral. And, and the, perhaps the differentiation from the US one was in the US one required, I believe, um, majority ownership of the US, um, of a US entity of, to, to have that law prevail. And the Luxembourg one actually took that away. In fact, you know, it does not require a majority Luxembourg ownership. So I don't know whether this example provides um, that type of, you know, yeah, test case. I don't know whether it has actually ever been tested. I mean, that's probably the, the challenge of a lot of these things is, you know, you, you put these laws out and, and uh, you know, and it's only when you have actually a real situation um, in the courts <laughs> to see whether, which, uh, which laws give what's, what level of certainty, but uh, please uh, for others to come in with maybe more pertinent examples. Uh, you're, you're touching on, on one of our, our issues, which we always have in the, in, the, uh, in the space area and regulatory environment. There are many of the aspects which we try to regulate are uh, really in theory. So we're sitting together at the table and we're debating and we're figuring out what possibilities could happen and need regulations. I think that's an important start because as talking about regulatory certainty, the first aspect is to have regulations to start with. I mean, just getting there, more and more uh, states are getting national space laws and moving in, in that direction. Uh, so that's that's the starting point. But uh, really, uh, what's what's the what's the proof in in practice is oftentimes uh, not really it doesn't really happen very very often yet. Uh, but I I believe it will increase uh, the more uh, relevant uh, space industry and and as well the the economic aspect of of space activities become. Uh, maybe uh, Kantara, do you have uh, maybe from from your practice uh, um, ideas on regulatory certainty and and any things that you could wish to uh, share with us? Yeah, actually, you know, uh, regulatory certainty is uh, you know quite important for financing, of course. And, but at the same time, you know, we cannot, you know, avoid, you know, having different, you know, regulations, you know, from one country to another. You know, there are countries, you know, one, you know, state or a jurisdiction would, you know, tend to, you know, establish its own, you know, regulation to enhance and facilitate the, you know, industry or development of the industry. And, so let's say, you know, aircraft financing, so, you know, we usually need to, you know, see their, you know, uh, regulations in, you know, the, you know, operators, you know, reg a reg a registration, you know, state, and, you know, that wouldn't, you know, kind of, you know, damage the importance of, you know, or, you know, availability of uh, aircraft financing. You know, we have, the, you know, very different, uh, you know, uh, regulations, you know, in aircraft, you know, industry, but uh, actually at the same time, even though, you know, there is a, you know, scope convention regime, 
you know, we have very varied and uh, you know, different regulations. And I would see the same in the you know, space financing. But uh, actually, you know, uh, the, you know, when providing you know, space financing, you know, financiers would of course you know, need to see their you know, uh, regulations in the operator's jurisdiction. Uh, but uh, actually, you know, to the extent you know, that is a uh, kind of, you know, foreseeable and clear from the, you know, outside or in foreign countries, that would work. And uh, actually, you know, we could, you know, have the, you know, attempts to, you know, summarize uh, the, you know, various, you know, jurisdictions in, you know, major, you know, countries or, you know, countries, you know, to which, you know, bankers and, uh, you know, financiers are looking to. So they're actually, you know, I would say that the internationally, you know, regulated or convention, you know, uh, incorporating the, you know, regulation would be very important. But at the same time, you know, we do not think that, uh, you know, different, you know, regulations would, you know, damage the availability of the you know, space financing at all, you know, considering the you know, practices in aircraft financing. Great. I, I think it's, it's very important that we also uh, exchange on the experiences on, on, on protocols which have been already in use and have been really successful, like the aircraft protocol. Uh, so it's very good that we're having this, this, this inter interaction with each other because we can only learn from that. I have one final question on my slate for the time being, and uh, maybe that's something that Gavin can uh, can can try to uh, comment on first, and that is um, how significant is the security interest of public or semi-public financiers, including the space agencies, extending finance to commercial entities in the space sector. Yeah, thanks, Oliver, and thanks. Um, you know, for the question from uh, the, the, the attendee at, um, at the webinar as well. I think it's been well attended, this webinar, so um, it's great to see the, the level of interest. Uh, I think that there's, it does relate um, this question to really what the nature of the financing is. Um, and I think Shiva and, and I have both sort of talked about some of the sort of venture debt, the quasi-equity type of instruments which exist. And so I think that the... Um, the level of significance of security interests, um, you know, is as important for the public or semi-public financiers as it is for private financiers. Um, at the end of the day, all financiers, regardless of who they are, do wish to to mitigate risk. Um, at the end, and, and so I think it's uh, equally important for um, any fi uh, financier. And you know, Shiva may have a, a particular view on that as well. It really is more about what the nature of the financing is that's able to be, to be provided. There's a lot of financing when you look at industry development by states that really is grant type financing. And that does hit clearly the bottom line of the, the budget of the sovereign um, in that regard when that's, uh, when that's delivered. And that's something which I think in the longer term is unsustainable. So how you can get a sustainable financing mechanism in place um, to ensure that there is reasonable return, you're managing risk, you're doing the appropriate level of due diligence um, you know, that will naturally then lead to what security can you, can you take regardless of your, if you're a public or a private sector um, financier is my, my view there. Um, if I can just mention, just touch on just the, uh, the previous um, question about the supranational agreement very quickly, I realise we're coming, you know, close to time. Um, and I, I don't know whether it's, uh, it, it just prompted my, my thoughts around the OHADA, um, the 17 African states under the um, for the organisation of harmonisation of corporate law in Africa, where they have let their security interest regime and other regimes come automatically into force um, in each of the jurisdictions. I think it's 90 days after they're agreed by the council um, there, as an example. I think that that may be a little, uh, a step too far potentially for many sovereigns. I think they would want to ensure that there's no conflict with existing laws and to be able to deal with that through their uh, ratification process um, as they bring them into law within um, their relevant jurisdiction, but it's certainly something which um, you know, might be worth looking at how that uh, a halfway step might be able to be achieved to be able to, you know, to, to deal with these issues as well. Thank you. Anyone else who would like to uh, comment on this uh, last 
recent most recent questions and actually not the last question but i probably have to close <laughs> anyway uh, well no i think it, as gavin was saying as uh, clearly if you look at it from an um, public finances perspective as an anchor uh, lender or investor um, wanting to be catalytic it's actually really important to have um, to be to to really have rather rigorous um, bankability criteria and 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 have the credibility in the market I mean clearly if you want to crowd in private capital and you're not doing your own homework right not only are you jeopardizing your own uh, economic viability as an institution, uh, but you also um, potentially damage your reputation and, and, and lower your signaling and catalytic impact. So hence, I would say very often it's indeed that the public sector is perhaps viewed potentially uh, being maybe too risk averse. And that's the question, you know, how, how can you strike that right balance in uh, in doing a, especially in new emerging sectors like new space where there's so many there are so many issues that still need to be fleshed out and understood yeah. well thank you very much i think those were very nice actually i would say closing remarks um it, it's it's clearly understood that this whole uh, effort is a is a concerted effort that neither the uh, practic uh, the uh, the um the industry nor the uh, the public uh, sector can really handle all by themselves. So we all need to work together. We need to uh, create an environment which is uh, uh, taking care of, of first of all, uh, clear uh, allocation of risk, which is mitigation of, allows mitigation of risks uh, possibilities. Uh, I would like to thank my panelists for these really lively discussion with the great contributions, all of them. Uh, I think uh, the participants hopefully got as much out of it as I did. I thought it was really very, very, very interesting. Um, I have one more question, but I think time's running out and I need to pass the ball back to Unidra for the closing remarks. So thanks again to everyone for their contributions. Uh, thanks for the participants, for the questions. And so I will pass, pass the ball back to Hamza, I believe. Thank you. Thank you very much, Oliver. And uh, I thought that was an excellent panel and uh, we received lots of very engaging questions and unfortunately we weren't able to answer all of them, but um, the, the UNIDRA Secretariat remains available. And if you would like, if any of the attendees would like to connect with some of the panelists, then, then we can certainly facilitate that. Uh, I'd like to now hand over the floor to uh, the president of, of UNIDRA, Professor Maria Chiara Malaguti to deliver some closing remarks. Thank you. Thank you to all. I think it was really extremely interesting, I must say. From my point of view, I really learned a lot to the point that uh, I can only really thank you for all what you have done. I think uh, from all what I could gather, I think there are consideration what access to finance means in the first place, and uh, not only in terms of new instruments, but also in terms of new liquidity and new assets uh, and international or really global instruments to be used but and then what what i personally always say is that space or the space of space in regulation is growing and growing and growing and it is really one of the topics for present and future so i hope we will keep on this kind of discussions and working together and also I have to thank michael who posed the question on the role of uh, you know, on uh, regulatory certainty and uh, the relationship between the international instruments and uh, domestic legislation, because this is really the only reason why UNIDRA exists and why we do this kind, this kind of instrument, which we believe is really for the development of the world and better results. So since space is somehow one of the major topics for the future, I really hope we can not only improve in the quality of application of our protocols and conventions, but that also keep on working on these topics with new uh, instruments uh, and uh, of uh, of any kind. So really, thanks a lot to all of you. Of you, it was really I'm really proud for the quality of the panels that uh, that my my colleagues can can put on. So it's really good. I hope we keep on with this, uh, and uh, I, I really thank you for the time and the effort that you put in this uh, in this exercise. Thank you on behalf of all Unidra. I think. Ciao.